Fantastic. Chatting to Audrey Tang. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much for making time. I'm really excited to chat with you. I have mm -hmm. lots of questions. Okay. Um, so it's now been five years since the Sunflower Movement. Mm -hmm. And could you tell me what was most significant about that moment from your perspective and what you think the legacy of that moment has been? So from my perspective, uh, Sunflower Movement is the first time that people have seen uh, with their own eyes, with half a million people on the street and many more online, that it is possible actually for the 20 or so NGOs to converge over time in the occupied environment rather than diverge as many other occupiers did. So a focused conversation is possible. I think that is a kind of existential proof that collectively raised the imagination of democracy emerges as a, um, you know, citizen assembly or people have to say, but rather we can actually converge on something actionable uh, with professional facilitating and civic technology. So I think that's the main thing. And the main legacy is, of course, that in Taiwan, many people um, now expect to participate in democratic affairs between elections. People's imagination has been open. So all the mayors, for example, following the Sunflower Movement, uh, who did not um, have an open government plan uh, lose their platforms. And people who do have an open government plan or who uh, participate in the Occupy found themselves mayor sometimes without expecting it. So there was this very fervent moment, this sort of fertile moment of um, disruption, uh, you know, after the 2008 crisis around the Occupy movement, um, and then in places like Spain with Podemos. Mm -hmm. um, but so many of those moments petered out mm -hmm. and they lost their energy. Mm -hmm. How do you, has the Sunflower Movement and its legacy maintained the engagement um, and energy around participation? I think that is because um, in Taiwan, we're relatively new to democracy. You see it to a lesser degree in Spain and uh, to, you know, many like Estonia who found it after the Internet. So for people who don't have a legacy system, there's less in OSHA, right, because there's no like 500 years, 200 years of Republican tradition to, to honor. Um, and so we're literally the first generation that can actually do democracy because it was kind of illegal in our parents' age. And so because of that, I think there's a, a lot more room to innovate. Uh, there's a lot less um, inertia to fight. And the public service generally see internet and digital technology as something that can potentially take away the risks and improve their efficiency and share the credit. Whereas if you have a very, um, you know, uh, system that is just on across generations, like five generations, then it's actually very difficult to challenge uh, as we're building a new uh, system to be complementary because then it will already have a kind of well understood norm in the society, but we don't have that norm. It's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, another one of my questions was uh, how you've, asking you how you've ensured that the bureaucracy and establishment are supportive of rather than oppositional to the idea of, you know, forking the government. Mm -hmm. um, how have they, because that is something that people, you know, even in my own um, experience, mm -hmm. there is um, a resistance to mm -hmm. new forms of input because mm -hmm. systems are the way they are, governments mm -hmm. designed to counter against mm -hmm. risk, mm -hmm. um, the very risk averse. How, mm. how have you um, been able to communicate mm. to the public service mm. that public participation actually de-risks the proposition? Right. So basically the idea is that we offer a net reduction of risk. And, and so um, there's three main motivations as far as bureaucracy is concerned. One is, as you said, management and reduction of risk. Uh, one, of course, is still very important is the efficiency and uh, indeed certainty of service. That is also very important. 
And the third thing, of course, is due credit, right? If a public servant uh, innovates, then they want to be recognized, not having the minister taking all the credit and only absorbing the blame when things go wrong, right? So, so all these three, um, credit, attribution, um, efficiency, that is to say, um, you know, uh, effective allocation of resources and uh, risk reduction. These three, they are not fungible, meaning that too much uh, forking the government ideals uh, somehow trade one for the other, but these are not fungible. Uh, all our offices improvements and projects are Pareto improvements in the sense that we don't try one for another. We make some um, advance a little bit on one of the three, but without actually causing more trouble on the other two. And because my office is literally horizontal, like one person poached from each ministry, and so because I don't give them orders, I don't take orders from them, I just ask people to work out loud. That's the only ask that I have. And because of that, any project that rose out of my office is kind of by definition a reconciliation of many different values across ministries. And that is how we make sure that a bureaucracy is okay with it because our office is over 50% just bureaucracy. It's just we don't have one dominant ministry and neither one dominant value. It is a, a cross-cutting, cross-silo organization. I find that really interesting because um, one of the ways that we've seen uh, the public service uh, treated traditionally is um, a as an anonymous entity where people didn't get individual recognition or credit for their contributions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seems to be counter to the way that you're approaching it, where you're empowering Mm -hmm. public servants that's um, right. that's right. and honoring them as heroes basically yeah that's great uh, i noticed that um taiwanese public servants are using apolitical the platform mm -hmm. how, how has that been useful in um your observation well um, a few things right they they share our story and they help us discover people doing more or less the same work um, we also engage with many other platforms like the Govern Gov Lab um, in NYU. Uh, they also have the Crowd Law platform, the um, Data Collaborative platform, and things like that. Because we we are given a lot of autonomy to freely join our international counterparts. That one team Gov from the UK, another great example. And all these great examples are just people, um, as you said, um, highlighting. Um, their individual contributions um, in a way that is not afraid for the public to learn from our mistakes as well. And so anything that is kind of culturally similar to ours, we're, we naturally found that very useful in the sense of building a platform for solidarity and reminding us that we're not in this alone and rather we're part of this global movement. It's interesting because what you say also really accords with, um, uh, you know, the economist Mariana Mazzucato recently been talking about elevating and celebrating the public service and mm -hmm. the way the public service has been hollowed out um, mm -hmm. over the years and de-skilled mm -hmm. um, and so much um, of their work um, and skill base has been moved to the private sector. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're trying to counter in Taiwan? Certainly. So um, I think in Taiwan, we have excellent public service, like a single pay, a very reasonable um, top notch healthcare system. Um, and our uh, we just started our tax filing season uh, and tomorrow is the first tax filing day. And again, this is all like cross platform. Um, very useful, um, like a full user journey designed by people who petitioned uh, to make it better and things like that, co-created text filing experience. And so a lot of things that in other jurisdictions would be private sector quote-unquote competitions uh, in Taiwan are just quote-unquote co-creations uh, from the citizens. And so it has long been a, a part of Taiwanese public sector culture to make sure that if there are services that the citizens just cannot opt out um, healthcare and tax filing being two prime examples, um, then actually 
um, we should approach it as a co-creative process rather than a private sector competition. Because in, in normal service design, in normal um, private sector, the client can always say no and switch to a competitor. But the fact is that you cannot say no and refuse to file tax or um, refuse to, to apply to Medicare where you can, but it won't get you very far. So but in, in these uh, circumstances, it makes far more sense to just uh, absorb the creative energy rather than just to disperse them into the private sector. So I have to pick something up, just 20 seconds. No problem. All right, thank you. That's some drinks. Okay. Oh, good one. <laughs> yeah. um, I've been talking to a lot of people who are working on deliberative democracy and participatory mm -hmm. budgeting mm -hmm. and more distributed forms of um, engagement. So people in Iceland, um, in um, Brazil, mm -hmm. um, in Belgium, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully soon Spain once their election's mm -hmm. over. That's um, right. mm -hmm. The challenges I see, one of the big challenges that's, that's mm -hmm. hardest hard to overcome, I think, um, is communicating um, how much how much time it needs to take for citizens to have a participatory and ongoing relationship with their politics rather than a sort of set and forget, vote once, delegation approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how have you overcome that in Taiwan and uh what um, what motivates people to have a more participatory role in their democracy? Right. Um, I think, first of all, uh, Taiwan is really having a, f a couple unfair advantages. Um, one is that uh, we offer broadband as a human right uh, because of a geography, right? So anywhere in Taiwan, even in the remote islands, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's personally my fault, you can talk to me. And uh, if um, anyone want unlimited 4G access plan uh, to deliver such broadband, it is uh, less than 20 US dollars per month from all uh, like major telecom operators. And so this is really unfair, right? <laughs> so because, of that, because of that, when we build e-participatory platforms, we don't have to limit ourselves as in other jurisdictions, like some of them use participatory budgeting, but they uh, are afraid that people won't have the bandwidth, so they have to use automated telemachines uh, in order to collect votes and display things like that. That was actually considered in Portugal. Um, and, and I mean, that's very creative, but it is actually very limiting because if you want to go to BPB, you first have to know about this and then you have to walk to a nearby bank and then you have to operate this ATM, which really isn't designed as a voting machine and, and things like that, right? But, but that's like the last month solution that they have. But now with like more social media accounts than citizen population uh, and free of uh, broadband, uh, not really free, but almost free broadband access as a human right. Um, I think that enables us to basically provide the full context of policy making so that anyone who wants to know any bit of the budget can just drill down to the budget item and have a real time conversation with public service on that particular budget item for all thousands of our national budgets, for example. And so I think that is this context um, mapping thing that makes it uh, more attractive because people usually are just curious, right? How how is my neighborhood doing and, th and things like that? And so it is just an informative piece, just like Google Map that people would, would like to explore. And if something occurred to them at that time, then of course they, they uh, just leave it on the platform or they start an e-petition or things like that. But it's all part of the flow. They don't have to specifically go to a town hall in a specific Sunday to do something specific. It's all kind of an ongoing process, just part of the exploration. And so there's also another kind of uh, motto that we're following is that we bring the technology to the space of people rather than asking the people to come to the space of technology. So once there are a e-petition with 
with 5,000 um, country signatures, for example, then we make sure that if it's a local matter, all the relevant ministries are summoned uh, into that locality and to have a real face-to-face -face conversation that is still amplified through 360 live streaming and so on. And so because of that, for everybody, all the stakeholders involved, they can minimize the personal cost to them to participate in this process. And if they are also always met with at least a equal kind of um, contextualizing um, um, benefit that makes sure that if they put in one hour of time, it can save right at least one hour of reading because people are contextualizing for each other. And so I think just making it a learning experience rather than something like a jury duty um, convinces a lot more people because it's it's more fun, really. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, let me just jump on that one point. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about optimizing for fun before. That's right. Can you explain what that means in an open democracy and particularly in a youth participation context? Why? So, you... Right. So a, a few things, right? Uh, it's instant gratification. Um, so just making sure that if people put in just five seconds, they get a rush thinking that they're they're contributing meaningfully to the democracy. So it can just be one upvote or one downvote, or it could just be one post-it note in a user journey and things like that. But all, always just provide a real-time feedback of how their single action mattered. And I think that is uh, very important. And the second uh, part is that once there is really a, a binding power to the consultative or co-creative process, always make sure that if they're willing to spend more than five minutes of time, if they want to spend 40 minutes of time, for example, then they can just like you did, email me and book my like 40 minutes of my time uh, on the record. And and because it's on the record, uh, then it also saves everybody else's time because then uh, you, you read my previous interviews, right? So it's like people build on each other. And so just being part of something larger is also part of the fun. So instant gratification, a way to just convert a small commitment into larger commitments and some way to make the larger commitment to transcend individuals. I think these three together makes this optimized for fun really optimal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell me about your when you have those consulting hours uh, mm. and very long hours by the way 12 hours That's right. That's sitting right. and waiting and you can anyone can book in to see you what do people bring to you what typically happens when you're at the social innovation lab well um quite a few things i mean just let me look at tomorrow's schedule because tomorrow appears to be a Wednesday, right? Um, it's Labor Day, but in Taiwan, public service uh, is still working uh, on Labor Day. <laughs> uh, so let's see, my first uh, booking is uh, from the B Lab. Uh, they're making a let's be the change together business for good uh, social innovation competition. And they're asking me if I can maybe hold a um, starting ceremony or be one of the judges and indeed connect that to our APSIPA Asia Pacific Social Innovation Partnership Award, which is our way to promote SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So that's one thing. The next meeting is from uh, Crossroads, which is a um, local organization uh, intending to make foreign people understand Taiwan more and also so making sure that P uh, Taiwan's uniqueness, like uh, our work in, in human rights, our work in democracy and innovation and things like that, is also translated into a foreign context because too much of this information is still just in uh, Mandarin Chinese and they really want to make sure that they're uh, you know, bilingually sound. And then afterwards, um, there's also a uh, mix um, like innovation design for social change um, annual summit. I think I'm going to connect social innovation to fintech. I think working on fintech inclusion, that's the main topic to talk. Uh, and there's then a team using AI to analyze, um, you know, biometrics to make sure that long for long term care um, circumstances, the elderly can uh, kind of automatically notify their clinics 
colleagues and their doctors if they have something um, that is kind of a, a accident uh, waiting to happen. And so they probably want some support uh, in the new um, telemedicine and te telediagnostics law. And if the regulations doesn't fit them, maybe they'll ask for a one year sandbox in which that we agree to not find them for violating the regulation in exchange for urban innovation and so on. And I can go on, but you get the basic idea of my other zones. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like when you're in in your office and um, having those consulting hours, mm -hmm. you're acting as a connector between mm -hmm. um, these, these different parts of government and different and civil society, mm -hmm. commercial, um, mm -hmm. government um, entities or individuals, uh, and then linking efforts to broader mm whether it's a sustainable development goals or, mm -hmm. you know, Taiwan's focus on mm -hmm. um, expanding its, um, you know, cultural mm -hmm. um, diversity or, or right. recognising right. cultural diversity. So would you define your role then as a, as a connector? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or really a, a catalyst, right? Mm -hmm. um, because a connector has something to connect to, but rather I, I just facilitates the... Uh, um, contextualizing uh, process and pose our conversation publicly to the internet uh, as uh, Creative Commons Zero transcripts and or YouTube videos. And because of that, I, I don't really know who I'm connecting them with, right? It's usually people who discover those transcripts, people who look at the Taiwan Social Innovation Platform, who discover they share common goals and energies. They don't even need me, right? They can just form synergies naturally together. And sometimes just by uh, occurring in the uh, Social Innovation Lab, they, they were waiting for my office hour, but they see a nearby event because any event that has one or more global goals as focus can freely use the Social Innovation Lab. So a lot of just um, spontaneous connections happen. And so I, I'm more of a catalyst. Of course, sometimes my intention connect but that's maybe one in three cases uh, I'd love to ask you about um, the V Taiwan process mm -hmm, sure. uh, I read your paper mm -hmm. uh, and found the the four steps fascinating mm -hmm. and the way okay. that you're using existing technology it's mm -hmm. not needing to build anything new really that's right it's all off the shelf all off the shelf um, and the success that you had um, through that process in reframing the debate about ride sharing. Mm -hmm. Are there any other examples that you can share mm -hmm. that show that method in practice? Sure, of course. So there's 26 cases and they're all on VTAL and TW. Um, and I, I think um, there's quite a few cases that really um, shines because they couldn't be done in the uh, other ways of consultation. Of course, people talk about uh, ride sharing and Airbnb because that's something that internationally everybody is facing a similar concern. But truth to be told, they could also be handled by regular consultation because there are unions and associations after all, right? So I think uh, where uh, this really shines is that, for example, when we're talking about teleworking, there really is no union of teleworkers because we're all in different industries. Or when we're talking about how to move Taiwan companies who register from Cayman Islands back into uh, being registered in Taiwan by introducing spatial voting stocks and closely held corporations, maybe company with English names and maybe company with a purpose um, driven like benefit corporations and so on. Again, there, there are no clear cut existing associations of all the Taiwanese companies that register in Cayman Islands because it's just <laughs> right, a, a, a tax device or a uh, governance device. And so in, in cases, in which there are no obvious um, top-down hierarchical organizations. That's where the V-Taiwan approach really shines because it enables people who don't have a voice because they don't have um, a organized uh, presence that has a protocol dealing with the government. Um, it enables them to discover each other, form a kind of ad hoc stakeholder coalition and even maintain their relationship afterwards. Um, and so I think V Taiwan has generated like the fintech sandbox 
like the self-driving vehicle sandbox, indeed the platform economy sandbox, all those sandboxes are basically ways for people who engage in open innovation to discover their own collision. And so Vita is not just a consultation process, it's a, pro it's a meta process that generates more consultative processes. Uh, yes, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, is this, that process, and I understand it's, um, what is it, the, the, the bonded coalition model, I, I have that quite right, we have a look, mm -hmm. um, the coherent blended volition mm -hmm. model. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea that it's the people who weren't a coalition before but find right. themselves exactly. with their values. Exactly. Uh, uh, if you, if, I mean, I think it's in, incredibly um, appealing. Um, mm -hmm. If you were providing advice on how, you know, a city might take up mm -hmm. um, a structure or a method like this, what advice would you provide? Well, uh, I'll just repeat what the co-creators of Social Innovation Lab um, has prioritised their consensus. Um, so the first thing is to have a kitchen and a cafe and a resident chef, excellent food. Uh, the second thing is for the place to be open until at least 11 uh, every night because the VTAO and weekly meetup is from 7 to 11, um, like every Wednesday evening. Um, and then um, I usually just stay until 10. Right? Uh, and um, then the third thing is to make sure that anyone who participates um, records fully either through um, telepresence or just regular, um, you know, Google Docs or HackMD as we use, uh, like making sure that people can discover this, what, what people are working on from afar. Um, I think with these three elements, that is to say excellent food, um, a relaxed atmosphere with no deadlines and timing, and a uh, recurrent uh, record keeping culture, um, anything can happen. And I think that are really the kind of offline ingredient of the online VTAVM process that people often overlook. And I really um, am very grateful to like Tom Atley, who really discovered this and wrote it in excellent blogs. That's interesting. I think we become so seduced by the idea of um, tech tools that we mm -hmm don't realise the importance of people being in a space. Well, these are also social technologies. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you, I, I don't think it was immediately clear to me what the relationship was between GovZero mm -hmm. um, and your role and the Social Innovation Lab. Oh. Can you explain mm -hmm. to me how? Sure. Whether, yeah. yeah GovZero is just a meme, really. Mm -hmm. So uh, the meme says, whenever you see any government service or website and think why is nobody making this improvement, uh, just admit being that nobody and do the same service but with the O replaced to a zero. So it's just a meme. Uh, the G0V.IT is from Italy uh, and they show also the Italian budget and uh, with uh, all the you know drill down just like in inaugural G0V.TW uh, topic. Uh, but they don't ask for a license or a patent or authorization or anything. It is literally just a meme. Um, and so people who are in the GovZero community, roughly speaking, uh, agrees to work out in the open using open source and creative common licenses uh, for the public good and in a radically participative way because it's kind of implied by the license, right? Um, it allows people who are even not of the same nationality to contribute because there's no domestic open source, right? Um, and so basically it's participation from everybody to the benefit of the public service um, and not just public servants, but to the public service. And, and I think um, this creates a culture of people just pressuring really, the government without any anything negative. So that's what fork means. Fork doesn't mean destroy what's there, right? It means taking what's there, bringing into a different direction with the hope that someday the mainline merges back or the mainline disappears and you become the mainline, right? Um, and so that is the fork in the government mean. And I think I just cultivate this meme. I consider myself a GovZero contributor, nothing more, nothing less.
um, and the Social Innovation Lab is one of the physical places that we're experimenting with open space technology, with focused conversation methodologies to make sure that the Cup Zero culture um, kind of seeps out from a uh, digital sphere and into a more day-to-day -day, like all the other sustainable development goals, not just goals 16 and 17. Uh, that that's interesting. So so just to clarify, does that mean mm. that actually this pro this practice mm. um, began in Italy? Mm. The practice of of um, I guess forking or that's or right, making that's right. um, yeah. And, and, and there's a Reddit now, a subreddit just two days ago uh, called Gov Zero. And again, it's just randomly started by somebody, uh, and people just police around it. There really is no. Um, any formal connection recognition or any um, numbering uh, system that controls who can use G0 V and who cannot. All the important brandings and trademarks and so on are all open source license anyway. So anyone who thinks that they fit with the Gov0 badge gets to use the Gov0 badge. Hmm. Uh, it's interesting because it's become so inter identified with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Well, it starts from Taiwan, right? Uh, it really became internationally known after the Sunflower Movement. So that's already more than two years um, after its uh, inception. And so, of course, it's associated with Taiwan because most Gulf Zero people learn it from Taiwan. But on the other hand, there's also um, many Taiwanese people all over the world, like Gulf Zero in uh, Washington, D.C., or uh, Gov Zero in um, UK, in Europe, and so on. Um, and they also participate in the main Gov Zero Slack channel, which is also a Telegram channel and an IRC channel. Uh, and they they report from you know over the world, trying to do pretty much the same thing. But they identify as Gov Zero contributor and less like Taiwanese. Um, and so I think there's a kind of overlapping identity. Mm -hmm. uh I've read in, in your interviews before that you've, you know, said that your introduction to democracy and, and politics and social organising mm -hmm. was online for years before you mm -hmm. got the right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, interestingly, the, the Citizens Foundation in Iceland also talk about upgrade, upgrading democracy, mm -hmm. um, new operating system. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the characteristics or principles of the digital world that most need to be put in this reboot of democracy? Well, I, I think the idea of forking is, is really core. Cool. Um, and even for software um, programmers, like the original domain in which fork is used, is not until the, the invention of uh, decentralized version control systems um, and with it, the conflict-free resolution data types, um, that it makes merging really almost effortless. It used to be um, the case when I first participated in the free software community, the forking is taken very seriously because it's very difficult to merge things back. And so if you fork something, it's forked for, for good. Um, but, but now um, with you know Git and all the different equivalents of Git in, for example, co-creation of documents, co-creation of spreadsheets, all those collaborative editors and so on, suddenly it becomes very easy to, to fork anything and still with the pretty good hope of merging it back. And I, I think that is a really great metaphor of governance. This is what we intentionally incorporate, as I said, as um, the sandbox regulations. A lot of sandboxes just fork regulations for a year and merge it back or as presidential hackathon where people take a proof of concept and delivering a public service in a different way and every year we pick five cases and the president say okay so by next year all those five winning cases will become public policy so it's all an encouragement of a little bit of deviation a little bit of forking but with the promise <clears throat> or at least with a high chance of it being merged back on the President's Hackathon, mm -hmm. um, are the core participants all civil servants? No, uh, we insist on building a trilingual team every year. 
So every year we select and indeed curate uh, 20 teams. And by trilingual, we mean that each team have to have at least uh, one technical expert um, on data or AI and so on, one domain expert, uh, whatever social issue they are trying to solve, and very importantly, one expert on public service, on regulation, on reg tech, essentially. And, and that is more often a public servant. And so almost by definition, it is cross-sectoral. And uh, we found that it makes most sense for each teams, if they don't have one of the three of the or two of the three trilingual roles to form these collisions before they actually try to develop the first prototype. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I want to talk about your um, super ministry um, mm -hmm. again and um, and how how that functions in practice. I, I read that, you know, you had too many volunteers and now you've got at least a representative, um, you know, the, the goal is to have one representative from each ministry. How does that function in practice in mm -hmm. terms of um, achieving outcomes? Do they come to the, uh, do, are they self-selecting in that they have an agenda or an issue, a burning issue when they come to you? Do, are there set political issues that are introduced or from civil society? How do, you, how do they determine what they want to act on? It differs from each ministry. So um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, have an agenda of pushing um, the idea of Taiwan can help on all the global goals. So that, that is just the value of our foreign ministry. Um, and then, of course, they are dispatched to our office, reconcile the work we're doing within the framework of SDG and making sure that we approach uh, foreign um, ministries or foreign organizations or foreign CSAs in a appropriate uh, platform that is conformant to the uh, UN SDGs. So that's what they bring to the table. Um, and um, there's many other examples. The people from the Ministry of Culture, for example, um, cares about youth engagement a lot and uh, takes care of engaging with our youth counselors to make sure that uh, they all have agenda setting power, not just on things people, young people care about, but really across all the different ministries and with a very accountable way of showing how each youth counselor have achieved, uh, not just in its um, agenda setting power, but actually in the delivery, because they are all, almost always co-creators of some kind of public service. And so build a report between the young people and the ministries, that's what the uh, our dispatch from the Minister of Culture bring to the table. So um, each one, when they join our office, what I look for is that uh, they bring a complementary skill or value set, and then they're more of a giver than a taker. And uh, that's really the only two hiring uh, condition that I make. And other than that, it is just pure horizontalism. People just chat among themselves to find interesting thing to do. Uh, and you've actually answered another question, but maybe you can clarify. I've noticed you using the hashtag Taiwan can help. Mm -hmm. um, is is that something that that is, is is that a directive from Taiwan? The idea that Taiwan can help on the SDG specifically, mm -hmm. or um, is that where that comes from? Yes. So it, it starts, uh, I think, from uh, not not all the SDGs. I think it starts from our bid to the World Health Organization. Uh, because of political reasons, Taiwan was denied entry to the annual summit of the WHO uh, for quite a few years now. Uh, and so, but Taiwan really is excellent when it comes to all sort of, um, you know, uh, just disease prevention and healthcare, good health and well-being and so on. And so uh, just for SDG3, I think, uh, as part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Health and Welfare, um, WHA bit, they dis dis developed this Taiwan Can Help hashtag. But then we discovered that actually Taiwan Can Help on pretty much everything uh, in the sustainable development framework. And so we gradually just expanded that to include all the SDGs. And, um, you know, as as others are learning from you, um, who are you learning from at the moment? Um, who, who are you modeling in terms of open government and participation? Hmm. So um, I think, uh, so in Open Government Summit, uh, I think that's one of the main um, venues uh, that the 
open government community gathers. And I think I learned from the cutting edge thinking of various communities. Like this year, the host country is Canada. And Canada has a lot emphasis on indigenous inclusion, for example. Uh, and that is something that Taiwan is also grappling with. Our president uh, herself, part indigenous, um, just formally apologized, uh, just for the indigenous uh, nations, different treatments and things like that, um, just a couple of years ago. And so we're really early on in this truth and reconciliation process. And a lot of our um, e-participation methodologies really is designed uh, with a more um, Mm, a, a, a Han ethnic norm, uh, to, for lack of a better term, uh, and that makes the indigenous population's participation not as uh, active as other people. I mean, we did excellent um, age groups, the 65 years old participate as much as our 15 years old. So we did that really well uh, in terms of inclusion, but not so uh, when it comes to indi indigenous. And so we learned from the Canadians and the way that they approach indigenous, um, honoring the tradition, making sure the truth and re reconciliation is indigenous driven, and we make sure uh, we learn from them. So we, for example, translate our open government uh, manuals and so on into indigenous languages, and that's a direct learning from them. So I, I can keep saying uh, a lot like concrete small things, but I, what I mean is that really inclusion, there is no end to inclusion. And just by making sure of paying attention to what every other culture is doing in terms of intersectionality, uh, often reveals uh, the kind of um, kind of hidden, ex excluded communities that we nevertheless have not yet considered in our open government process. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Audrey. This has been really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, thank you so much for your time. And um, and yeah, this is fascinating work. So thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you. And thank you for contributing to the Creative Commons. Uh, Proceed and upload it to YouTube. All right. Oh, great. Thanks mm -hmm. so much, Audrey. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.